Those who only know Los Angeles through film and TV tend to imagine a world of fame and affluence. But in reality, Los Angeles is a vast, diverse, and complicated city. It is a sprawling metropolis made up of neighborhoods and many individual communities held together by the love of the car and the interstate highway system. Perhaps none other is more famous than the Century Freeway Interlink in the heart of LA. To truly understand its impact on the region, you have to experience it through past and present, through the glitz and grit of the colliding communities it has displaced. Located at the critical juncture of the I-105 and I-110 freeways, it sits in the center of LA and connects downtown to the Port of LA as well as LAX Airport to East LA, where the majority of residents live. While its importance is undisputed, the project has been a highly controversial one. It has divided neighborhoods across concrete lines, fragmented the automobile community into automated and non-automated passengers, and acted as a vessel for the exploitation of public funds. For nearly 200 years, Human independence was entirely reliant on automobile ownership, despite the persistent efforts to create alternative transportation networks. Angelinos, along with the rest of America, never bought into trains, metros, subways, or even the Hyperloop idea as a primary mode of transportation, thus dooming sprawling cities like LA to a permanent state of blockage. The freeways that were once built for speed and convenience became bottlenecked interchanges, traps for congestion, and ultimately the interstate highway system became more trouble than it was worth. What once freed us became a pervasive shackle to everyday life. In the 20s, however, as the role of the car in society's mobility grew to a state of instability, a viral disease swept the planet, forcing a time of isolation. The spread of COVID-19 resulted in a series of domestic lockdowns enforced across the globe. For over two years, LA residents used their cars for essential purposes only, and the daily deadlock traffic that LA was known for came to a sudden and definitive end. During the COVID era, vehicles sat dormant and a future with little to no traffic was glimpsed. The systematic 9 to 5 spell that society had become so accustomed to was broken in 2024 and had finally created space for employees as well as business leaders to rethink the daily commute in light of virtual options. And when businesses began to reopen in August of that year, remote work and flex time were in demand, quickly becoming the norm. Within a few years post-pandemic, Work life had completely transformed most industries from in-office work to purely remote and online collaboration. With the radical cultural shift from office work to digital platforms, paired with a mass exodus from major metropolitan areas, the volume of traffic in LA followed suit and drastically diminished. As the digital highways became the primary form of commute, the physical freeways took on less responsibility and thus, less importance to the city's operations. For the first time, the traffic, signature to LA, began to flow, and even rendered the freeways highly underutilized, at times even completely void of cars. In 2028, the city and urban activists such as UCLA City Lab conducted full reevaluations of the LA freeway system. While it lay mostly dormant throughout the year, pressure mounted up on the city to do something productive with it. The interstate highway had become the new LA River project. Researchers, architects, and city planners envisioned the inner city routes in a reduced form, composed of less lanes, narrower passages, pedestrian bridging, park capping, and in some cases, full decommissioning of underutilized portions. 
Methods for freeway intervention were not entirely new to the 20s, as Boston had already attempted to move freeways underground with the Big Dig project garnering attention nationwide. And even the removal of freeways had had success in the Bay Area with the demolition of the San Francisco Expressway in 1960. Unexpectedly, this created precedent for future removal projects. The removal of the excess freeway resulted in reduction in traffic, as drivers were no longer given the opportunity to congest that portion of San Francisco. Eliminating concrete freeway structures also beautified the area by giving public plaza space back to the communities and bringing people together rather than separating and dividing them. On another front, major developments in automated vehicles took place during the post-COVID era tech boom. Innovative automated models proved to be better at navigating traffic, more efficient, and despite the scrutiny, much lower risk than vehicles controlled through purely manual means. Once cars could identify elements in their immediate surroundings and make complex choices based on the situation surrounding them, manually driven cars were put into question. Automation worked better in a networked fleet of vehicles, where all included cars were either retrofitted with LiDAR sensing technologies or came pre-built with automated capabilities. Big tech seeded ideas and research into smart road infrastructure accelerated talks to create fully automated networks that excluded manual vehicles. With the backing of Fortune 500 companies and AV manufacturers, they successfully argued that unpredictable human drivers must be taken out of the equation to implement driverless environments. Unsurprisingly, as with all rapid advancements in technology, a side effect of the smart road proposals required consumers to provide their own expensive equipment, be it retrofit or personal AV, and would remain inaccessible to low-income communities. The smart road network would be contested all the way until its construction in 2046, and would continue to be plagued by negative public comment as a new redline effort. As political support grew for smart transit infrastructures, AV companies turned their attention to the highly trafficked I-105, I-110 interchange as a key hub within the autonomous network. Various designs were proposed for the site, with the interlink proposal by JGA Architects coming out atop the pack. The concept of the interlink was to connect and fully automate the smart road system as it would efficiently shuffle vehicles around the circle in an almost frictionless manner, accounting for minimal slowdown as they change direction. The interlink roadway stack exchange was pitched to upgrade the existing degrading and ill-maintained sentry freeway ramps with a circular overpass optimized for autonomous vehicle redirection. This would allow the city to decommission the old interchange completely, thereby saving the city maintenance and repair costs, and also give public space back to the adjacent communities. By 2043, the interlink system was permitted by the city and was approved by a coalition of mayors. Truio of LA led the group that included the mayors of Compton, Southgate, Inglewood, and Gardena. In addition to the automated interlink roundabout, the final proposal also included an adaption of the existing interchange into a park intended to reconnect the previously divided communities. Mayor Trujillo's coalition and the development group also promised that the AV road would undo the injustices of the past after tying communities together with the construction of the interlink. This park space was to be a new forum to these reconfigured cardinal axes and would attract tourists and provide exterior space for the nearby residents. Many in the surrounding community opposed the sentiment, however, saying the design did little to serve the community at large and that the park seemed more like an excuse to shirk the responsibility of demolishing the old freeway than an intentional design for public good. There was also a widely acknowledged prediction that the interlink was the first in a series across Los Angeles intended to transition existing freeways into an AV-only system, 
forcing those who could not afford the newer technologies to the back roads. The mayor did little to diffuse these concerns when he passed the project without public appeal. The surrounding residents recalled the last time that a piece of infrastructure was served to them. It caused a fracturing of the neighborhoods, dropped property values, and delivered none of the promised housing to the surrounding community. In remembrance of the interchange project, the people put up a forceful resistance filled with protests, public figure smearing, and other social media mudslinging. Ultimately, in the face of heavy opposition, the Interlink project was seamlessly pushed through the city after heavy lobbying by tech and big banks who hoped to benefit from the investment in AV infrastructure. The Interlink was a complete success for the AV community and has resulted in the freeways we are familiar with today. However, it failed drastically on the equity promises it made. To no surprise, Mayor Trujillo and the others were discovered to have received private funds from tech companies involved in the deal, and all five resigned. Sadly for those in opposition, it was in vain, as the project had already been completed before these findings were made public. The splitting of old driver-operated freeways and navy roads caused radical class inequality in the transportation realm, rivaling that of LA public transit busing. In addition, the park that was promised was never realized, and the area was left empty and unmonitored, allowing crime to fester. Today, a very different development is slated for construction at this juncture. After much heartbreak and strain produced by the interchange and interlink over the past six decades, the area is now currently in design as a new urban neighborhood. The megastructure proposal at the crossroads of these different social and transit-oriented issues focuses on providing community services to the existing neighborhoods as well as its own self-sufficient housing. The bold plan to build atop such a congested and politically sensitive site deals with an unprecedented dimensional zoning where elevated freeways already reserve much of the airspace. It is now in the hands of architects and urban planners as to what this place could become, whilst also preserving community values and protecting the underserved neighborhoods of central LA. Despite the opportunity for visionaries to dream up something radically transformative and ethically just, nearby residents still remember the site's checkered history and will have a hard time accepting a new development of this scale.